retreat, a word that for some of us makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside and makes us long for time alone. And for others, fills us with dread at the thought of not having people around us constantly and possibly having an hour of activity that may be deemed by some as unproductive. My journey to the cave has been one of becoming more like the first person I described. Most of you who know me will know that I love to be around people. I'm an external processor and a raging extrovert. When I first finished university, I did an intern year with G2 called Forge. This involved running the children's work at G2, attending staff prayers at the Belfry and weekly group teaching sessions where we had input from a variety of in internal and external speakers. A huge part of this year was getting to know ourselves as leaders better and essentially giving a year to God after 18 years in education um, to see what he wanted to do next. And what a year of growth it was. During our group sessions, we did the Myers-Briggs test, which most of you will know basically tells you about your personality. One of the sections tells you whether you're an extrovert, gets energy from being with people, or an introvert, gets energy from spending time alone. I came out as 95% extrovert. I mean, honestly, serious problems there. During this year, I spent pretty much every waking moment with people. As I lived with five other interns who I worked alongside, um, however, I, I began, I also began the journey to the cave, beginning to glimpse the difference spending time there could make to my life. The book that this talk and series is based on is called Ancient Ways and it looks at the practices of Celtic missionaries during the 17th century. They quickly discovered that absolute permanent solitude doesn't suit most of us and that some degree of community was necessary. Thank goodness for us extroverts. They did however see the value of the practice of stillness, study and prayer which, as they do in the book, I'm referring to as the cave. Put simply, this idea of the cave denotes the time we spend with God while doing nothing but being with him. It's important to note that this is not the time you spend praying while driving or washing up. This is the time that is definitively you and God, nothing else. We are talking quality time here. If you're a parent, it's the quality chats around the dinner table with your kids about how their day was or the bedtime story moment just before bed when it's just you and them for some one-to-one -one time. For the Celtic missionaries, the cave was an integral part of their lives and where they found strength to be able to do their work. The cave is a symbol of a life of withdrawal which for these missionaries was an individual and solitary practice. One of the places that was key for these missionaries was the Holy Island in Lindisfarne, which is still a place of retreat and encounter for many Christians today. On Holy Island, there's a small separate island that was used by St Cuthbert to pray, often in the cold and dark through the whole night. For him, the cave was a pla the place that he went to first and foremost to find power from God, to then go and do everything God had called him to do. I believe this is such an important message for us today. Pray first, then go. Particularly in the world of busyness, demand and instant gratification that we live in today. Entering the cave was firmly established then as a central feature of the religious life and it has shaped every monastic movement since. I've never been to Holy Island but I've experienced a taste of monastic life during a visit to Teze in France last summer. I went on pilgrimage with the Archbishop of York and over a hundred young people from Yorkshire to the French monastic community founded by Brother Roger during the Second World War. What a place! The best way to summarise my experience for you is to read a section of the blog I wrote on my last day there. The experience has left me feeling exhausted, peaceful, hopeful and inspired. Largely, I have been blown away by the reactions of our students from Balby High, many of whom have had little experience of faith or prayer. 
They have diligently attended the three prayer meetings a day and are coming away with a greater sense of the value of silence and reflection. They have lived on basic, simple meals and in tents and are coming away with a deeper gratitude for all they have. They have participated in Bible small groups where they discuss sections of scripture and are coming away with ideas about how they might apply what they have learnt to their own lives. They have met young people from all over the world and have come away with a renewed love for different cultures, languages and a new sense of belonging in this place where everyone is welcomed and accepted. I find it absolutely phenomenal how much a monastic place of prayer and retreat could teach a bunch of teenagers from Selby, most of whom don't know who God is. All of the experience I had mentioned in my blog clearly has had an impact on them. But most no the most noticeably significant was the five minutes of silence during each of the three prayer meetings every day. We watched the students go from fidgeting and looking at their watches in the first few days to relaxing their minds and enjoying a new sense of peace by the end of our time there. This was by far my favourite thing about the trip. If my students, in their absence of faith, can be moved and feel restored in such times of silence, how much more then can we, as lovers and followers of Jesus, benefit from this time with our Heavenly Father? We see many times in the Bible where Jesus also benefits from time out drawing near to God. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift, up their ha you, you, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendour. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. How much of a badass was Jesus after 40 days in the wilderness with his father? Now, most of you will have read and heard this passage countless times before. I even had to memorise pretty much all of it from my religious studies GCSE. Yet, have you considered the power of the message before? Jesus, son of God, takes time out to spend 40 days with his heavenly father. During this time, he is equipped to beat the temptation of the actual devil. If Jesus needed time out with God to draw strength and rest, then how much must we need it? Not only does Jesus demonstrate in this passage the importance of retreat and rest in the Father, but in fact, God calls us to it. He calls us to sit at his feet and draw on his strength. In Lamentations chapter 3, it says... Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust, there may yet be hope. The message version puts it like this. When life is heavy and hard to take, go off by yourself. Enter the silence. Bow in prayer. Don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. Don't run from trouble. Take it full face. The worst is never the worst. Don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. I love that. Sometimes God calls us to be still before him and spend time in his presence. Full stop. Just be. Hope 
will appear. Just wait. One of my favourite things that Mike Pilavachi says, from the couple of years we've taken the youth to Soul Survivor, the more we wait, the more God does. So it's countercultural just to hang around waiting in this day and age. We want everything here and now, no messing around. But God doesn't work like that. For him, it's all in his timing. There are countless other parts of the Bible where God calls us to him, to come to him, to just be at his feet. Hebrews verse, chapter 4 verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jeremiah 31 verse 25, I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Matthew 11 verse 28, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Mark 6 verse 31, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get rest. These are just a few examples, there are so many more. Many of these focus on going to God when you need rest or in a time of need. But some of the best times in the cave for me have been when I've been feeling on top of things and well rested already. Don't get me wrong, I've crawled into the cave on my hands and knees countless times too. But I'm just saying, hang out with God wherever you're at because life will be so much better if you do everything out of a place of rest in him. We're not just talking about sitting in quietness for quietness' sake, though. It's not just recharging the batteries and time with Jesus is like a supercharge. Time in the cave with the creator of the universe and the creator of you is opening yourself up to him to remind you of who you are and whose you are. Science has revealed that alone time increases empathy, increases productivity, and sparks creativity. It really seems of no surprise to me that there is a strong correlation of leaders and churches moving powerfully in the Holy Spirit and greater amounts of time they spent with God. When the church is empathetic to the needs of the world, feeling energised to do something about it and produces creative solutions to the problems they see, it is clear that time spent in the cave is bearing fruit. The journey to knowing God must include the discipline of coming to know yourself. I don't know about you, but the prospect of getting to know myself better is slightly terrifying. I hate spending time in my own head. I'm too much of an overthinker. However, when you put it in the context of spending time with God, getting to know the person he made you to be alongside him, that seems much more appealing. Your calling might not be to be an overseas missionary, but knowing yourself well is something that is strongly sought after by employers too. I was at a meeting for a Women Into Leadership network that I'm part of with work. Um, and we heard from the Deputy Director for Education from the City of York Council. It was really interesting hearing her story of how she worked up the ladder from classroom teacher to where she is now. It struck me hugely how much she spoke about the key to being successful in any career was getting to know yourself, what you're good at, what you're passionate about, essentially getting to know who God's made you to be. If we want God to be king of every area of our lives, maybe we need to start connecting where we are with how we're designed. Maybe something in your life has new, moved from its original intent and now you're simply taking it through the motions. Time with God in the cave can help us to reconnect with what's important, both to you and to God. You may be in a time now where you're experiencing your life without the benefit of the cave. You may have experienced it previously, or perhaps this is the first time you're hearing about the idea. Not just rest, but one-on-one -on -one realigning time. Getting your marching orders, hearing God speak truths over you that nobody else could. Without the cave, there are two common implications. One, 
we forget that we need God in our lives. We act in our own strength and arrogance and commit our time and energy to what our human minds decide is important. Or two, we grow fearful. We worry that we don't have the capabilities that we need. Our imperfection shouts louder at us than God's grace and sustaining power in our lives. We never try to spread the gospel because we can't imagine that we are chosen. We cannot neglect the cave. One of my favourite quotes from the Ancient Ways book is, In aloneness, everything that we can imagine is us, but is not really us, falls away. We come to see that much of what we surround ourselves with is just a facade. We begin to know ourselves. We begin to know ourselves. Where do you go when you want to hear from God, in good times or in bad? Where do you go when you need to be reminded that you are loved, you are known? Where is your cave? We don't all have an island to go to like St Cuthbert and for most of us it isn't practical to spend the whole night praying. God does, however, still call us to this today. He calls us to daily give him time, our full attention, no distractions. Choosing a time and a place for your cave time is going to look different for everyone. Maybe you already have a routine that works well and you could share it with others. Maybe this is the first time you've heard anything about this concept. The hope is that if we build in this regular time to connect with God, we aren't going to him on our hands and knees when we're struggling and have a thousand prayer requests. If we go to God, even if it's just for five or ten minutes each day and we share everything with him, doing life alongside him, things never really get too much for us to handle because then we're going with God and in his strength. I love to run and I find that I meet God as I pound the pavements. Being near the ocean also makes me feel close to God, but I've definitely not got this sorted. I still have a long way to go. Maybe we could share in the comments section below success stories from the cave. When have been your best times in the cave? Do you have somewhere to go that helps you to connect with God especially? Could you use this time of isolation and uncertainty to draw near to God and create new rhythms of cave time with him? Could this time be more of a blessing than we ever expected it to be? I'm going to leave you with one of my favourite quotes from the Ancient Ways book. The journey to the cave is a tough one, but it must not be avoided. And in time, with openness and dedication, we may discover that the dark cave is actually filled with light. <laughs>